In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the impact of nanoscience and nanotechnology on sensor development. First, uh, before going into the nano sensors, uh, I will give a, a brief background on what is a sensor and what are the typical sensing principles and the transduction platforms uh, and the need for sensors, you know, that kind of a broad introduction. Then I will zoom in on the application of, you know, gas and vapor sensors. So what is a sensor? Uh, sensor is a device that produces a measurable signal uh, in response to an external stimulus. For example, uh, the sensor will respond uh, when it is exposed to uh, certain uh, gases or vapors uh, when there is a sudden change in the environment, you know, the environmental change may be in the form of a, a gas or a vapor, uh, or change in pressure, change in temperature, uh, you know, many of the properties of when the environment changes, uh, the sensor will respond to that change through a change in mass or conductivity or some other measurable property, either directly or indirectly. Uh, the motivation to have a sensor is to monitor the environment surrounding us in order to gain knowledge and use that knowledge in a useful purpose uh, later on. So when we construct a sensor, we have to keep in mind there will always be external effects. Uh, these external effects may be due to um, temperature or humidity, uh, altitude, shock and vibration and other mechanical changes. So what do we expect from a sensor? Unlike an instrument, uh, instrumentation, you know, instruments are huge. Uh, the instruments can actually make, um, you know, measure changes in the environment too, but they are uh, big and bulky and expensive. Uh, so unlike analytical instruments, the sensors are expected to be very small in size and mass. They have to be inexpensive, they have to be reliable and accurate, uh, they have to be stable over uh, long periods, uh, and they also have to uh, provide very high resolution. So before we go into uh, the sensor development, uh, I want to provide some of the basic definitions uh, in the field of sensors. The most important definition you will come across is accuracy. Accuracy is about how closely the sensor output matches a true value. But how do you even know what the true value is? That means you have to calibrate the sensor against a known instrument. So are you know, comparing against another instrument system that you already know, which is accurate and very close to reality. So the difference between the output of the sensor and the actual value, you know, that is obviously the error. Resolution is the smallest change in the environment or ambient that you are measuring that can produce a measurable signal in your sensor. So obviously then the resolution is limited by the noise of the system. So that brings us to the definition of noise. Noise is just random fluctuation in your output signal, even when there is absolutely no change in the input. So the noise can come from you know, many different sources. For example, mechanical vibration can lead to the noise in your sensor system. Electromagnetic interference. Uh, when there is a thermal change in the, in the environment, then the sensor will uh, exhibit some noise. So these are all some possible sources of noise. A drift of the sensor is related to a gradual change in the sensor response over the time, uh, even when your input uh, environment completely remains constant and stable. So the, all sensors just tend to have some small amount of drift over in you know, a period of time. Uh, minimum detectable uh, signal. Uh, so this is the minimum signal uh, that you can get from the sensor when noise is taken into account. If the noise itself is very high compared to the output, then it's going to be very hard for you to get any kind of a meaningful signal um, over the noise. Detection limit is the smallest value of the variable, whether you are measuring temperature or concentration of a species, whatever you, whatever you are measuring, detection limit is the smallest value of that variable that you can measure using the sensor. Uh, stability, that relates to the ability of your sensor to produce the same output value when the input conditions are completely constant over a period of time. Repeatability, that refers to the ability of the sensor 
to produce the same response over and over again even when you make the measurements successively keeping the same input uh, and also keeping all the operating conditions identical over a period of time. Uh, reproducibility that refers to the ability of the sensor to provide identical response for the same input even after some condition has been changed. For example, you turn the sensor off and then turn it back on. For the same input condition, you have to be able to get the same response uh, and that refers to you know, reproducibility. The sensor response time refers to the time it takes for the sensor to give you an output signal in response to a, a change in the stimulus. The moment that you introduce a change in the stimulus or, or, or the environment, uh, the response time uh, is generally measured as the time required for the sensor to reach 95% of its uh, final value. The sensor recovery time is essentially the reverse of the response time. When you take away the stimulus uh, or when you take away the change in the environment, so the time it takes for the sensor to reach 95% of its final value is called the recovery time. Sensitivity is defined as the ratio of the incremental change in the sensor output signal you know, to the incremental change in the ambient that you are measuring. Selectivity you know, refers to the ability of the sensor you know, to discriminate that one particular component that you are looking for you know, which is present um, among you know, many many others. And selectivity by the way is, is very uh, important uh, parameter because when you're trying to measure a, a particular gas or a vapor in an ambient, the ambient has got a, you know, a huge variety of other things present. So your ability to pick out that one single thing that you're looking for, so that is called selectivity. The next topic that I want to cover is transduction platform. What is a transducer? It is a device that converts energy from you know, one form to another form. When you try to measure something, it's not always possible to measure the variable of interest. Uh, for example, uh, if you're interested in you know, monitoring the environment you know, for pollution, and when there is a change in a gas or a vapor, you may not be able to measure that directly. On the other hand, when the gas or vapor gets absorbed onto a material, it's possible to measure the change in some measurable property of that material. For example, uh, the mass of that material could change uh, or some other property like the conductivity of the material could change. And so you measure one of those properties and then correlate you know, back to the concentration. So, you know, that is the transduction you know, process and it could be achieved in many number of ways. Conductometric or capacitive um, you know, type sensors or they could be optical sensors, electrochemical sensors, solid state sensors uh, or the sensor could be based on acoustic waves. So let me go over uh, some of these uh, platforms uh, in some detail. So the first type of sensor I want to talk about is conductometric or capacitive type uh, in a sensor. So here you apply the sensing material over a pair of electrodes on a substrate. Uh, you can measure the electrical conductivity or capacitance in response to an applied voltage. Uh, if you are measuring the conductivity, it is governed by the Ohm's law. You know, voltage divided by current is given by resistance. Uh, or if you're measuring the capacitance, then it is in you know, a charge divided by voltage is given by the capacitance. So you can measure both the conductance and the capacitance either under DC conditions or under AC conditions. Typically the electrodes, uh, they could be simply like a coin type electrode or um, you can make interdigitated electrodes essentially to increase the surface area and then the material can be deposited on the electrode. We will talk about the nano electrodes a little later. One example of a conductometric measurement is when you have a, a, a tin oxide thin film on an electrode, the conductivity of the tin oxide will change when it's ex exposed to a, you know, different types of gases and vapors. What I'm showing here is the conductivity of a tin oxide thin film in response to changing concentrations of oxygen. What is plotted on the y-axis is a change in resistance uh, normalized by the baseline resistance, delta R over R. 
or in reverse you can actually also plot you know delta c over c where c is a conductivity so conductivity i mean conductance and resistance um, are inverse properties uh, so that is uh, this delta r over r is measured as a function of time so you have a baseline resistance uh, you know to start with at time t equal to zero then the sensor thin film is exposed to 100 parts per million of oxygen then the resistance of it uh, uh, goes up as you can see from the curve then after a certain time you know when you take away the source of oxygen the resistance goes back to its baseline so that is the recovery time uh, and then after a while when the sensor is exposed to thousand parts per million of oxygen now again the resistance goes up if you notice you know this time the resistance value is much higher compared to the resistance you know for 100 parts per million uh, and once again after a certain time elapses when you take the source of oxygen away uh, then the resistance you know goes back to its baseline so you keep on repeating this you know next for one percent and then for ten percent so in each of those cases the resistance really shoots up in response to oxygen so this is this is one way of actually you know measuring the response of uh, a sensor uh, to oxygen so here we are measuring you know resistance likewise you can also you know measure uh, capacitance the solid state transducers they consist of a metal semiconductor junction or semiconductor semiconductor junction essentially the way they work when these sensors or when these transducers are exposed to a you know change in ambient like a, a change in a gas or vapor then the a current voltage curve of the solid state, uh, the, the metal semiconductor or semiconductor semiconductor junction uh, changes. So you can easily measure the change in current or voltage or capacitance or even impedance. Uh, the different forms of solid state transducers include simple, uh, you know, PN diode. It could be a bipolar transistor, or it could be a Schottky diode, or it could be a metal oxide semiconductor, you know, mass capacitor or it could be a field effect transistor. Acoustic wave transducers, they utilize uh, the so-called piezoelectric materials. Uh, two types of acoustic wave transducers are very common. You know, one is called the bulk acoustic wave uh, transducer. In that case, the acoustic waves propagate you know, throughout the solid. In contrast, the surface acoustic wave transducer uh, the wave propagation is confined to just a region you know, very near the surface of the solid. When we use the acoustic waves, essentially we measure uh, the change in the wave propagation, whether the acoustic wave you know, propagates through the solid or just go, goes over the surface. The change in the path of the propagation of the, the uh, acoustic wave, that will result in a change in the velocity and amplitude of the wave itself. Uh, you can monitor the changes in the velocity and amplitude by measuring the you know, frequency or phase characteristics of the acoustic wave. Then you can do back correlation of these changes uh, to the physical or chemical properties of the environment that you are trying to measure. Quartz crystal microbalance uh, is a classic example of a bulk acoustic wave res uh, resonator. So the quartz substrate is machined into a very thin disk uh, and then uh, you deposit a metal pad on both sides of the thin disk that would allow you to apply the electrical signal. So what happens is when you apply an electrical signal that creates acoustic waves uh, and the trapped acoustic waves you know, resonate back and forth within the crystal uh, creating resonance. When this microbalance is exposed to a, an ambient with uh, you know, changing gas or vapor, Adsorption of this gas or vapor onto the quartz crystal changes the mass of the quartz crystal, essentially increasing the thickness. So that is going to change the wave characteristics. So we can make use of this change in wave, uh, this property uh, and then try to measure the concentration of the gas or vapor. Uh, you can also add a, a sensing layer which will be specific for a particular gas or a vapor that would uh, you know, help with the selectivity in discriminating uh, one particular gas you know, over a 
a big confusing background. So the quartz crystal microbalance uh, acoustic wave resonators are commonly used in environmental monitoring, gas sensors, and biosensors. Surface acoustic wave transducers, uh, they utilize a form of interdigitated you know, transducers and uh, you can pattern them on the surface of a piezoelectric crystal. As I mentioned in the case of the bulk acoustic wave uh, case, uh, you can also add a sensitive layer uh, that would be responsive you know, to the specific species of your interest. Uh, you apply an AC voltage uh, to the input side of the uh, uh, interdigitated transducer that will launch the acoustic wave. Uh, the wave then travels along the surface of the piezoelectric crystal and then goes over to the output side of the interdigitator transducer. There it is getting converted to the uh, back to the electrical signal. Uh, so the saw transducers are used in sensing you know, temperature, acceleration, uh, force or pressure, uh, electric field, magnetic field. Uh, gas flow, environmental monitoring, and changes in gases and vapor, and also uh, biosensors. Uh, there is a cantilever based transducer. You can fabricate a micro cantilever uh, which will resonate uh, when there is a change in the ambient. And the change in the ambient could be a, in a gas of vapor or a change in humidity, change in temperature, change in pressure. Any number of variables can induce uh, or resonate the micro cantilever and the resonant frequency will change you know based on the magnitude of those changes this could be very useful in uh, when you try to monitor you know mass or heat or temperature stress or radiation uh, or concentration of a particular uh, species uh, so the resonation frequency is typically from you know 100 megahertz to 5 gigahertz it depends on the cantilever material uh, and also the size of the cantilever um, itself. You can use the you know, cantilever to monitor biological interactions, for example, you know, antigen-antibody um, interaction, uh, hybridization of you know, DNA strands. So the smallest change in mass that you can detect uh, using a cantilever is uh, 10 to the minus 15 grams. Finally, electrochemical transducer. These transducers, they generate you know, signals you know, from the presence and interaction of chemical species. Here you are making use of chemical effects to monitor species, uh, the concentration of various species. There are two types of effects, you know, one is a voltometry, the other one is called amperometry. Uh, in voltometry, when you bring together a two dissimilar materials, that results in the development of a, a so-called contact potential. In the case of amperometry, which is also called galvanic effect. So here you are bringing together two different conducting materials and then you put them in an electrolyte solution, a potential di a difference will develop. 